tror det. Jag vet inte. Jag hoppas det. Men det spelar ingen roll vad jag säger. Poängen är att jag talar svenska. Att kanske två eller tre personer här. Jag tror att det finns någon där som förstår vad jag säger. But the whole point is that you're a little bit surprised. It was either this or full frontal nudity. <laughs> and I made an educated guess and I went with the Swedish. Go figure. I like to talk to you a little bit about surprise because that's sort of my thing. This is live Jew. I'm a live Jew. I teach how to make mistakes on purpose. Thank you very much. And I taught this at the art school in Reykjavik in Iceland. And I was in the, you know, computer room with the tech kind of guys around. And I was making a poster to announce my talk and my workshop. And this guy comes up to me and says, are you Jewish? And I said, well, yeah, but what gave it away? And he said, well, your name, Rosenwald. Your name sounds kind of Jewish. And I said, well, it's true. I'm a real one. He said, you know, you're the first Jew that I know. And I said, yeah, and you just met me five seconds ago. So then I thought about it, and I put a big banner on the top of the poster that said, live Jew. And it was like standing room only. <laughs> it's fantastic. So I can't really expect that, you know, here. I'm not so unusual. But uh, anyway, so this is how to make mistakes on purpose. I'm going to talk mostly about this idea and show very, well, relatively little of my own work, much as I would like to. But um, I did this workshop this morning, which was really fun. This is something that we promise in the workshop. Do you know what omerta is? Any of you? Some of you? It's the mafia code of silence. So what we do is when people take the workshop, they are afterwards they can say, oh, it was stupid. I hated it. Lori's an idiot. It was just totally worthless. Or they can say, I loved it. It was great. It was so much fun. But then when their friends you know, or coworkers say, well, what did you do in the workshop? Omerta, OK? So it's a little bit hard to promote the workshop because I can't describe what we do in the workshop, except it's really fun and great. So this is a drawing, surprise, surprise, by my friend Rina's daughter, Vida. And it describes the whole point of the workshop. It's a little bit hard to read, but it says, you never find anything good here. This is the rainbow and the pot of gold. You see the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? And then it says, this, however, is worth it which is over there, this little blue arrow to this whatever thing. Not where you're looking, but it's like when a magician is doing a trick, they're, you know, blah, 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 and everything's focused here, but the real stuff is going on over there. It's misdirection. You all know that word, right? So it has to do with that, how not working works better than working. Not trying works better than trying. So that's my whole shtick, my whole point. So I want to talk about Studio 360, which is this really great radio show that Kurt Anderson has on NPR. I did the workshop. He took part in it. That was really great. He said, why don't you do the workshop on the radio? Now think about this. Radio. I mean, this is a totally visual thing, right? I thought, great, this guy is crazy. But I want to do it. All right, so we did the workshop in his studio for his staff and everything. And of course, because it was a completely crazy idea, it never did air. But Whatever. Anyway, he got his producer on the phone talking to me, saying, well, you know, what if we're not, you know, you're an illustrator and you're in this visual realm and graphic design and blah, blah, blah. But what if it's somebody, you know, like in marketing, it could be somebody in sales, it could be a financial kind of person or um, any kind of job. What is it, you know, what's it good for your workshop? So um, I said, well, suppose you're a radio producer. And he said, I'm listening. And I said, well, suppose you're ready. You could just, you could ask me, you could interview me and say, hey, Lori, uh, how long have you been doing this? Or where'd you go to school? Or how'd you come up with the idea? Or any number of different questions. But suppose for one of the questions, instead you grab the first thing on your desk um, and let that suggest something to you. So I said, I'll do that right now. So I grabbed this book on my desk, this novel I was reading. And the first two words on the top left were gold bullion. So I said, OK, Lori. Uh, are you making big bucks with this, with multinational corporations, or is this some kind of an underground art school workshop thing? Now, it might not have been the best question, but it was probably one he wouldn't have asked otherwise, which is the whole point, is to do things that you don't do and ask things that you don't ask. A lot of people on the stage were talking about how do you get ideas, you know? 
talking about sampling, talking about how people come up with stuff. My father um, sent me this clipping about Georges de Mescal, who was in Switzerland, and he went walking in the woods and he got burrs stuck on his pants, you know, those little plants, right? And then he was going like this, he thought, oh, what could this be? And then he invented Velcro. He didn't sit down at a paper and say, I'm gonna be creative, and what this world needs is a new way to stick stuff together, and I'm gonna be creative and I'm gonna do that. It was just something that happened, and then he said, oh, what could this be? And to me, those words, what could this be? That's the whole point, okay? So what I do in the workshop and what I try to do in real life is to create chaos and situations where people, you know, everybody knows that stuff like penicillin was invented by mistake and blah, 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 blah. But how do you do stuff like that on purpose? So it's a way to sort of get out of, or around yourself and your normal way of doing things and your normal way of working and all the skills that you have to come up with something new. This to me is the devil. This is a very, very bad thing that I never, never want to look at again. It's bad. And this is also bad. Because I work as an illustrator, I got a lot of really silly assignments. This one is about the 21st century mom, okay? She, her name is probably Jennifer. She's about 25, she has a tattoo, she eats organic fruit. She's in her uh, second trimester. She's hip to new technology. She has an iPod and a Blackberry. She exercises regularly, blah, 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 blah. Glad to almost meet you. Now these are people I never even talk to on the phone, I don't really know, and that's an odd part of my job because of in a way, because of email, I never meet a lot of the people that I work for. And so I'm just sort of like an arm for hire drawing these things, and it's kind of weird, and I need to make something better for myself. So what I need, although I don't tell my clients this, is that I need a blob. These are bullet holes. This is something that I printed up from something that I stole from something. <laughs> this is a breadboard. This is a roller, paint roller thingy. So what we do in the workshop is that we create a lot of things like this that I could call mistakes, or you could think of them as burrs, or instead of burrs, or just something, a starting point, so that you are never alone with a white piece of paper again, okay? You're never alone with your own limitations. I mean, sometimes when I give talks to groups, I think, okay, I mean, this is a little bit more diverse group than some of the groups that I've talked to, or some of the classes that I've had. It's like, well, you and you and you and you, you've seen some of the same movies, you're sort of the same age, you know, so people aren't that different. But when you're like drawing with shoe polish, you're more different than you, do you know what I mean? If you're both using a very sophisticated computer program, I think what you and you might do might look very much the same. And I think that that's why a lot of stuff looks alike now, which is really, really boring. For a children's book that I was doing, I had to draw a canary. Now, I don't know about you, but me and I think most of the people on planet Earth, if you had to draw a canary, what would you do? Exactly, you go to Google Images, press a button, and bam, a thousand canaries. Easy peasy, right? But I don't want to do that because I, don't, I want to be different. I want to do something else. So what I do is this. Now, I don't know what you think, but I don't see any canary here. Okay, I'm pretty imaginative, but I don't see no canary. All right, so, but I have these images, like all those different black and white things. They're always black and white because then you can make them any color you want. So I have these things. This one I call long rips for some reason. So I take one of these rips. Yeah, I take one of these rips Okay, I turn around, uh, turn around, color it yellow, put 800 point type that says canary, some legs and a beak and some eyeballs, and you better believe it's a motherfucking canary. Okay? That's how I work. You know, not take the right thing like everybody else, but you take the wrong thing. Something that ain't no canary becomes a canary. All right. So this is the same thing. These are more blobs, just stuff that I like. This was also made with long rips. This is a drawing for the New Yorker. I also work for the New Yorker, but not as a cartoonist, even though I've tried many, many times. <laughs> Sorry. But I work as an illustrator for the New Yorker. I like things that are perfect, but not perfect. Like when you print up like old wood type that they used to use 100 years ago. It's fantastic stuff, okay? Or I, think, I find things in old type books. I have like 10,000 fonts in my computer, but I don't want those. I want the one that I don't have, okay? And that you don't have, maybe. So I find some old book when I'm in Italy. You know, I'm really, really old, and I lived in Italy in 1980, and I got all these old books. I take something like that, and I 
you know, put it in my computer and then I have it and it's not like something that you all have. And it's not digitized, it's something else and it gives something special. So I do a job and I use those typefaces. I use something that has fallen through the cracks, okay? So it's a little bit special, it's a little bit weird and different. Ikea was uh, making these postcards for the thousands and zillions of people that, uh, that apply for a job at uh, Ikea, but they don't get it. So they say, you were almost perfect, but we found somebody else that was even more almost perfect than you, and we gave them the job. <laughs> anyway, um, so then I collect all of these images and stuff, and I use them. I used to live in France, and I did all these posters for this company called BHV. So I use these images, see the, the eyes, these over there. It's just something I took from a magazine. I steal things, I sample things all the time. Wood grain. You know, my father died a long time ago, but I have his writing, so I can make him write things for me. Okay, so um, I steal things, I take things. I'm never alone with that piece of paper and my own limitations, okay? That's the point of the whole thing, is that you always have a starting point, and yes, it's stealing, yes, it's sampling, but in a sort of a different way than we were talking about before. I used red wash and then I had this great postcard that I found in a German design museum of red vinyl. And the way that I work is really ass backwards. It's like I want to do what I want to do. I want to, you know, just be creative and have fun. But my, my clients, that's not their goal in life is that Lori Rosen will have a really good time, right? <laughs> Top secret, all right? So what I do is that I make stuff first. And then I, real, then, I, then I try to figure out a reason why I made that thing. And then I tell the client, it's because blah, blah, blah. Do you understand? <laughs> I decided to make a guidebook for New York because I had all these, because I lived in Europe and I had all these friends that used to visit me. And I was starting to make lists of all these restaurants and places. Oh, where do I get my hair cut? What do I do with the kids? Blah, 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 blah. So I made this book without really realizing it about New York that turned into this guidebook called New York Notebook. But I had this red collage that I wanted to use. So there was this really great restaurant, very cheap, called Peperoso, red pepper. So I made a thing about that because I had a red collage, not the other way around. You understand? So that's the way I've always worked. But I used to be in the closet about it, like it was a bad thing. Now I go around the world and I talk about how it's a good thing. I think it's a very good thing. And I think a lot of people do this, but they don't want to admit it. They go around doing whatever they want to do and then find an excuse and then tell people it was on purpose. So this is a New York notebook that has a lot of stuff in it. This is a drawing I did for the New Yorker about 10 years ago. I did this in Illustrator. Now I can use, to a certain extent, Illustrator program, you know. I sort of learned it kind of okay. So I could do this drawing about a dead cat for some reason. Um, but there's a lot of illustrators that work obviously with the program called Illustrator. Uh, you know, but a lot of things end up looking alike. Like I said before, I think that these computer programs are very powerful and they want you to do things in a certain way and so everything starts looking alike. So I don't do that. I do something that is imperfect, something that is wrong, something that is a little bit human and blobby together with using Illustrator, using a little photo collage, whatever. How Magazine gave me some pages and I did a thing, I'm a commercial artist, which is a non sequitur. You know, like kind of dead, sort of pregnant, commercial artist. <laughs> yeah. These are some of the materials that I use. This is me. This is a, one of the drawings that we did in the workshop. You know, fun, happy guy. These are, you know, f we framed some of them, you know. IKEA made sheets just recently. It just came out and made sheets and um, bedding and all kinds of stuff using the things that we did with a workshop uh, at Beckman School in Stockholm. And so this is the page from the catalog about how they came up with it. And they totally ruined everything we did and I'm not that happy with the result. But anyway, go buy them. <laughs> this, this is one that I like. This is more student work. Just things that happened because of the workshop. A lot of this stuff was done in Sweden where I live for no particular reason. Anyway, so I just like these, right? And none of them took more than like five minutes to do. So I create situations with chaos, with a lot of chaos and loud music to get around, you know, all the skills that people have and do something a little bit different. So this is just some of the results. SJ or SJ is like Amtrak in Sweden. I just like some of these images that students did fast. Now here's the thing, computers don't make mistakes. 
which I think is really fucked up. So I like things that are perfect but not perfect, like this. Then I put this slide up and I gave a talk and my friend, no, but listen, wait. So I gave this talk in Sweden and then my friend Andrea said, I would have chosen both. And I thought, wow. This is the thing I did with, you know, David Sedaris. June 13th, 2005. Anchorage. Sometimes things happen and I don't know what to do with my face. Take my cousin who lives in Australia. A year ago I met with her and learned over dinner that she and her husband had just taken part in the world's largest tractor pull. There were over a thousand of us in an unplowed field, and you could see the dust from space, she said. And I sat there with my mouth open, wondering how I was supposed to react. Do you say, great, or I was in space, I didn't see any dust. <laughs> you laugh or cry or pass out on the floor. I honestly had no idea. A similar thing happened during last night's book signing. A man approached my table with a couple of paperbacks and told me I should visit this bar. It's in the Yukon, and serves something called a sour toe cocktail, which supposedly comes with a frostbitten toe lying like an olive in the bottom of the glass. Now, what do you think of that? He said. Again, what do you say? Uh, can you order a virgin sour toe? Right? <laughs> well, say you don't drink alcohol, I said. Could they make you with ginger ale or something? The man looked exasperated. I guess so. Then I said, oh, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so this just came out. This is an app now for uh, Android and iTunes uh, it's called David Sire. Really fun. So this is these things I did for Target and Times Square. That was really fun, too. And stuff for Ikea, and something for the New Yorker, and something for Sweden that they sell in the post office that's envelopes, and the New Yorker, and my book called All the Wrong People Have Self-Esteem. <laughs> it's, it's true, right? Isn't it true? It's supposed to be for teenage girls, but I really think it's for anybody that thinks it's funny. Something for the New York Times. Oh, this I did like the other day that's coming out in the New Yorker about Ikea, or Ikea, in about a week. And that's it. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>